facilities that make this program possible are provided by the City of Highland Park. Programs are produced independently by members of the community. The City of Highland Park is not affiliated with the following program or the producers of public access programming and is not responsible for the content. The following program does not reflect the opinions of the City of Highland Park. Hello, and welcome to Commons Current Events Roundtable. Today we have a wonderful guest, uh, a guest that I think you're really going to enjoy, and things that you may have not heard before. And her name is Sarah Van Loon, and she's from AJC Chicago, and Sarah's going to tell you all about that. And we're going to talk about global Jewish advocacy. And that is, we're going to be talking about it. It was founded in 1906 with offices around the world, and it works to enhance the well-being and security of Israel and Jewish people to advance human rights and democratic values for all. And Sarah's going to tell you about the, their diplomacy, their legislative advocacy, their coalition building, and communications. Oh my God, Sarah, this is quite a lot of things that you do. Welcome to Cummins Roundtable. Thank you so much for having me, Suzanne. And it is a true pleasure. Thank you for coming and talking about this. And um, we saw each other um, not too long ago. We met, and I thought that this is something that we really need to bring to the table. In fact, I didn't even know that this program was around. And I thought I knew everything. See, I, I'm always learning. And you work with a lot of diplomats. You work with a lot of um, uh, mayors, governors, people from around the world, um, probably leaders, presidents, prime ministers. I mean, I, everybody's included in this program. And this is really uh, an amazing program. Uh, we've had, you know, we've had a lot of shows on what's going, you know, anti-Semitism in the colleges, and but we haven't talked really about global anti-Semitism that's that's going on around the world. And maybe you could talk a little bit. Uh, start with first of all, what is AJC? What does it stand for? And how you got involved in it? And talk about let's talk about what they're doing. Uh, around the world, you know, globally. Sure. Well, again, thank you so much for having me on your show. So as you started with AJC, we are the American Jewish Committee. We've been around for 111 years. So we uh, stand for human rights and democratic values for all, and of course, promoting the safety and security of the state of Israel, and indeed for all Jewish people around the world. So I found out about AJC about four years ago. I was working in the Jewish world, but I felt increasingly frustrated with what I was seeing and reading on the news and not only what was happening around the world, but here at home as well. And I felt like there wasn't anything I could do personally to help make a difference, to help stand up for Israel. And that's when I found out about AJC. So when I learned... And you said it was a hundred, how many years? 111 and, years. And I'm just finding out about it and it's 111 years. I mean, you know, you hear about Jewish United Fund and you hear about all these other groups, you know, Stand With Us, we had, you know, people from Stand With Us on the show, um, and we have not heard from you guys. So I am yeah. so happy that you're here. So tell us a little bit about how you started in, you know, yeah, so it all goes back to that initial frustration and wanting an outlet for that and wanting to find an opportunity to do that. And that's exactly what I found at AJC. When I learned about not only their local advocacy efforts with local diplomats and interfaith and interethnic leaders, but also on a national and global scale, I realized that I could use my voice to help make a difference on these issues and that it could actually make an impact overall. So I was very, very fortunate when I was looking. They had a staff opening, so I was able to kind of jump 
jump in as a staff member, but I also put my money where my mouth is and I, I joined uh, Access, which is AJC's Young Professional Division. And so I'm one of the, on, their, on their leadership level with that because I wanted personally still the opportunities to, to advocate on these issues that I care so much about, to be able to defend Israel's right to exist, mm -hmm. and indeed to defend all minorities and groups worldwide. And you know, um, Sarah, which is really interesting, is that um, you come from a different you come from a different background than most Jewish people, um, and your background is you came from Christianity background, mm -hmm. and you converted to Judaism. Okay. So you have a completely different. You see things out of different eyes. You know, one eye <laughs> Christianity and how they see things and now out of you know how Jewish people see things. And which is really good because uh, not everybody gets a chance to, you know, to do that. I think my heritage was very similar to yours. And um, and so, uh, you know, I've been, I'm so happy to meet somebody very similar to my own background in many ways. And so, um, you know, I, I, I see also things from different I, ideas and different backgrounds and different teachings that I went through. And um, I'd like you to, you know, Talk about, first of all, um, what did you see about Judaism that really, you know, got your, you know, you got your goat, got your, you know, you wanted to, you know, because people, you know, there's so much anti-Semitism around, and yet you're part of joining this is a very group that's having, you know, those eyes upon them. Absolutely, and that was a big concern for my husband when I first told him that I wanted to convert. Um, really, it came out of, I, I kind of um, grew up, as you said, as an evangelical Christian, and then at my Christian college, I kind of realized that there were questions that I had that weren't really being answered, and the more that I looked, the more that I sought for, for different reasons or, or uh, outcomes, what have you, I found those in Judaism. And the more that I read about Judaism, the more that I got to know it both by working in the Jewish community, by marrying my Jewish husband, the more I realized that that was the best fit for me personally. Um, so my husband and I, we've been married for seven years. I didn't convert for our wedding. Um, it wasn't something that we really thought about back then. So seven years after we were married, I personally made the decision to go through a conversion process. In fact, I converted through Anshe Emmet, which is a conservative synagogue in the city. They've got this incredible Jew by choice program. And it was perfect for people like me who had a religious background growing up, but were looking to learn more about the Jewish faith. We're looking to become a part of the Jewish peoplehood. And it was such a warm and welcoming environment. I learned so much. I made so many great connections. I'm so grateful for you that said, opportunity. You said a lot like Ivanka Trump. She oh, went yeah. very, you know, through her conversion and the same type of thing. Yeah, it's deeply meaningful. Yeah. And so what, you know, what is going on, you know, what, what I can't understand, why has anti-Semitism, and we just did the show on uh, anti-Semitism in colleges, and the group that I had with Stan with us, were two young men from the University of Illinois talking about anti-Semitism in the colleges and what to do about it for students. What is all this, what's happening all of a sudden? In Europe it's getting, you know, it's exploding and why is it going on right now? So and what is age, and, and, and if it's, you could also speak to the point of what AJC is doing about it. Absolutely. So one of the things that AJC has been seeing, one of the trends that we've noticed is that the rise in anti-Semitism has also been correlating with the rise in populism within Europe. So what previously used to be on the margins of society or only espoused by real extremist voices is now getting more leeway and leverage to be able to, to join the public discourse. So a lot of that, we believe, has to do with lack of education. So in Germany, you're actually seeing a positive trend because of their longstanding efforts to educate not only about Jews and Judaism, but about the Holocaust about dealing with their, their problems as a country and facing that head on. And you're not necessarily seeing that throughout all countries in Europe. In fact, recently there's been an increase in Holocaust revisionism where you know we'll hear from some countries that, oh, they actually saved the Jews and they weren't ones that had to deal with it at all. 
when really history shows a very different story. Like in Poland, for instance, they've, in fact, they have a, a Holocaust museum now, mm -hmm. which was really, you know, because uh, because I know people in Poland, uh, there, there were a lot of Polish people that did, that were very helpful and did save a lot of Jewish people, but there were a lot of them that did turn in a lot of Jewish people as well. And uh, then you find, then you hear that the museum, the Holocaust Museum, is now in Poland, and uh, which is kind of shocking because, and and so there are there are different programs that are, you know, that are uh, obviously working toward uh, against, you know, a, you know the BDS movement, and and also programs that are for the BS, BDS programs around the world too. Maybe you can talk a little bit how AJC uh, does, how they, you know, when, when, we, when you hear of the BDS programs, you know, tell, you know, the sanctions and, uh, that they're doing against Israel and uh, Israel products. What does AJC, when they hear something like that going on, what do they do to co combat it? What, what's the, what are their... Absolutely. So AJC it bounces into action. It's not like we've been sitting on the sidelines. As we mentioned earlier, AJC has a global architecture. So we have five offices in Europe, one that we just opened uh, in Poland in Central Europe that covers seven countries over there. We've got an office in Berlin and in Brussels. So we reach out to our interlocutors. We reach out not only to diplomats that we have relationship with, but also the people who are making policy decisions, because we understand that when, the, when a country's highest governmental officials come out and firmly denounce anti-Semitism mm -hmm. and bigotry in all of its forms, there tends to be a decline in anti-Semitism. So we want to support that and help them in whatever ways that we can, whether it's through education, both for lawmakers as well as citizens, through different programs, and also through relationship building. These are all very important avenues for AJC. And as you mentioned earlier, our communications, that's one of our main messaging that we're able to do now. So. AJC has the largest media platform of all of the global Jewish advocacy organizations. I believe we have over 400,000 followers on, on Facebook or Twitter. And so we use our multilingual media platform to help spread this education, to help spread this awareness, and to be able to combat rising issues such as the boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement. Now, do you, do you actually talk to, do you ever get a chance, like, say, in France, where it's get, you know, where you hear a rise in anti-Semitism, do you get the chance, uh, how do you get to, um, is it president? Is he pre president, Mike Macron, right? Because yes. mm -hmm. I some are prime minister, some are president, some you know are chancellor. Do you get to talk to like uh, you know uh, Macron or or Prime Minister May or um, 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 from Germany, Mrs. Merkel? Do you ever get a chance to does somebody get to them personally? Oh yes, absolutely. In fact, our European director Simone Rodin Benzaken. She also oversees our Paris office and she's based in Paris. So we're very fortunate to have someone like her because she has very close connections, not only with many members of the French government, but also with Macron himself. And so, you know, there's been certain instances, whether we see it happening in the UN or in other bodies where a major issue will come up and we'll want to go straight to who we believe will be the most effective. And we're able to call on those relationships and the partnerships that we have to help not only share our concerns, but also if they need advice or recommendations to help provide those resources as well so so they they hear you absolutely and they get and they get the message to their people which is really important so you're touching on really I mean the main people up there you know you're not just talking to just you know you know maybe not just only uh, maybe people that like representatives in the district, you know, you know like, uh, but you're talking to major players here. Of course, but that being said, it's also really important for us to engage with lower level diplomats as well, because many of them are career civil servants. So it's not that, 
you know, they're only in that position and they don't go anywhere else. Many of them will continue on. They'll get promoted within the foreign ministry. Some will even become the foreign minister or the prime minister. So AJC very much keeps the long game in view when we're, when we're dealing with anyone, quite That's frankly. right. They could become the next president or uh, prime minister. You don't think about that. Exactly. That's true because they may, you may think they have a lower level job, but they come up pretty fast. Exactly. And so it's important for us to keep in mind with any relationship with, that we're building that this isn't just for this single issue or this single moment in time. We genuinely want to build deep, lasting mm -hmm. relationships. We want our interlocutors to look at AJC as a trusted resource, as a centrist, moderate organization that's not going to you know, sway this way or the other, depending on what's popular at the time, per se, but that we really take a long measured view at our issues and that we're, we're trusted advocates for that and I think that our relationships and our successes have spoken to that as well. Now if you if, if countries are more like you said populism or nationalism how do you get to these people um, because you know years ago I guess Germany was nationalism that's what happened the rise of Adolf Hitler and it would, the nationalism came up and like we have now, there is some rise, you said, of populism. But then we have, you know, I think uh, it was a, an article I saw by, um, by uh, Alan Dershowitz. And it was an article that it talked about the hard right and the hard left poses different dangers. You know, where the, the extreme right was the neo-Nazis, the Ku Klux Klan, uh, and then you got the the left, which is the Antifa that's coming up, all kinds of other sort of sort of radicals, also pose a danger. Uh, you know, even in the U.S., it's coming up in the U.S. So in the colleges where the Antifa people don't like uh, if there is a, a group that's uh, more pro-Israel and they don't want them to speak. How do you handle that type of thing? What is a what you know not you personally, but a you know the whole group of AJC? What do they do for this? Absolutely. So. One of the ways that AJC works on campus issues specifically, whether it's the BDS movement or just any kind of pro-Israel student who wants to help make their voice heard or just wants to feel comfortable being a Jew on campus, we try and equip not only the student, so we've got different programs either spanning from high school or different college opportunities, but we really want to make sure that issues, trends, groups that we don't believe should have the limelight, so to speak, that we don't give them extra fuel to that fire. So don't fall down to the same traps or pitfalls, if you will, of becoming protesters at their own event. Options are to do different counter-programming or to have a silent vigil outside for when, for example, for when Linda Sarsour spoke in Chicago, instead of having this large, awful demonstration, we hosted a vigil, uh, the students of Northwestern outside of that completely silent, you know, for anyone who wanted to, to enter that, we weren't denying them hearing her speak. We don't believe in, in suppression of speech with that regard. Uh, but we also wanted to make it known that there are real victims and there's real consequences to these actions and a different speech, um, you know, that they, they promote. And so AJC works to find diplomatic solutions, I would say first and foremost, to, to many of these issues and opportunities. And frankly, it all comes back to building relationships. Mm -hmm. How are you able to have a conversation one-on-one -on -one with another person as a human being? You know, to step outside of, well, I'm on this side and you're on that side. Where are issues that we have commonality? What are things that we can agree on? And how can I truly listen to you and your, your concerns as an individual and likewise? And that's, I think, the only path forward that we have for creating a more unified and just world all around. What do they do like at Northwestern has a week anti, you know, anti-Israel week, which they call um, the same word as um, what happened in South Africa, which is um, oh, apartheid. apartheid week. Yes. Thank you. Senior moment. <laughs> apartheid week. What do they do every, every year? They have apartheid week at Northwestern, you know, here in Chicago, nor, you know, in Evanston. And this is our hometown. And how does AJ see um, what do they do about that? And how do they how do the 
How do the uh, Jewish students feel about that? Yeah, so AJC, we want to work with the on-campus Jewish community that's there. We definitely don't believe in coming in and kind of saying, this is what we believe and this is the only option. We want to support the Jewish groups that are there in whatever way we can, whether it's through resources, for counter-programming. Um, but really, I think what comes up during these apartheid weeks is, how can you help educate or re-educate people that have a very different view of what's going on with Israel? And how can you both listen to their concerns and show that, you know, supporting Israel doesn't mean you're negating everything that they're concerned about. AJC has been a long time advocate of a two-state solution, so we as well want self-determination for the Palestinian people. And so I think there's other ways of having that conversation and not necessarily doing shock and awe tactics like putting up, you know, an apartheid wall on campus. Um, I think they're often just trying to get students to be uncomfortable with who they are, whether it be Jews or Christians that support Israel. I think it tries to really shut down a student's opportunity to voice themselves. Yeah, I think we talked about, we were having a good lunch today at the Bluegrass together, and um, we were talking about uh, project interchange. Yes. Now that sounds like something, now when they have apartheid week at Northwestern, project interchange could be going on at the same time. Uh, which which I thought was really, I'd like you to explain to our viewers what Project Interchange is. Absolutely. So Project Interchange has been around AJC for more than 35 years. And what that does is take thought leaders, governmental officials, students, people in the media on special trips to Israel. So what they do is they bring them so they can see firsthand what it's like to be living in the Jewish state. And I think it's very hard for people to, to really understand what life is like until they've been there themselves, until they've not only visited Israel and see how close some of the towns are to the Palestinian territories and where there's other terrorist activities, but also to take them into Ramallah and for them to meet Palestinians and for them to understand what it's like for Palestinians living there as well. And so, what it's like for Pal you know, people, and Project Interchange, do they ever take any students that are not Jewish, that are, you know, that are Christians or they're they're from, you know, the Muslim background. Yes. And 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 people that we're talking about. And I think I I said Black Life Matters, but you said it was a different organization that is teaching uh, anti-Semitism. You, you called it what? I believe it was the Movement for Black Lives. They had put um, Israel black, as an apartheid right. state on there. And I so, could be wrong, but I believe right. and, and so taking some of those students that are actually at Apartheid Week with their signs, Apartheid Week, everybody should be against Israel because they're the, you know, they're the aggressors, they're taking away the rights of Palestinians. And these people, these students, to take a few of them along on Project Interchange and really show how both Israel and the Palestinians, they do work together there. I, you know, I, I think I mentioned one of the shows, my son was a, a doctor in Israel, surgeon, and when he, he would operate on not just Israelis, if Palestinians needed an operation, general surgery, he didn't say, hey, you're a Palestinian, I don't work on you. He worked on, you know, he, he treated the Palestinians as he treated the Israeli patients. It was all the same. And they need to know that Israel does that for their, you know, they're, if they're, somebody's sick, they go into an Israeli hospital, you know, they're, and at, uh, they come into the universities, they're welcomed at uh, all the universities in Israel. They have both, it's not just Jewish students at uh, Hebrew University and all the other universities in Israel. It's mixed with both, you know, Muslims, Christians, Jewish, all together. Absolutely. AJC has had great success. In fact, this past January, we brought a delegation of student leaders from Brown University to Israel on a Project Interchange mission. And that was one of our main goals. We specifically chose students on campus who were going to have an influence on others. So one of them was the, the main editor of the student newspaper and because we wanted them to not only see firsthand and they what weren't life Jewish. was like. Exactly, they right. weren't Jewish. Okay, I just want to get that across because I think that's really important. Yes, I would say the majority of the participants on Project Interchange are not Jewish uh, because we believe it's important for anyone and everyone to have the opportunity to visit Israel firsthand and to see how complex it actually is. Just as you were saying earlier about Israel as the Goliath, I think it's very easy to make media assumptions 
and say Israel is this, you know, big Goliath and the Palestinians are this weak David. But it's not as simple as that. And I think AJC really works to bring the nuance out of that and the complexity. And the student leaders from Brown who came back, all of them we interviewed before and after, you know, what are your mm -hmm. what do you think about this? What are your positions on that? all of them had complete changes in their perspective on Israel. And they said, I had no idea that this was a possibility. I had no idea that this was what life was like. And one of the students even said, now when I see an anti-Israel occurrence happening on campus, I am much more likely to step mm -hmm. in and help you know, defend Israel because I've been there and I've seen firsthand what it's really like. And I think that is one of the most powerful things to come out of Project Interchange is the changing of hearts and minds and really perspective perspectives of people about Israel. How do they, you know, Sarah, I, I always, I've often wonder, these are young students, how do they start thinking about this right away? Why do they, why, you know, you, you would think that students would be more open to everything. Why, why are they taking um, sides so early? Why, you know, because it, it, it seems like, you know, Colleges now, I mean, not even colleges, like middle schools, high schools, they bring, you know, I know everybody, you know, in, in, the, in this area, say Deerfield High School, Highland Park High School, uh, Glenbrook North, all these different high schools are very open to, uh, you know, they talk about everything, you know, and, uh, and the kids seem to get along really well, and then they go to college, and they become so anti this and anti that. What happens when they go to college? What, how does this how does this work? Well, I think I don't think it's a new phenomenon. I mean, think about even back into the 60s. I feel like I heard, you know, my parents' generation and the generation before that always complaining about young college kids. I think it's just the time where they're able to come and figure out ideas on their own. But I do think you brought out an important point that while they may be taught certain things in school, in, in their, you know, high school and, and earlier years, it's once they get to college that there's more of an opportunity. What is your social justice state? going to say how are you going to act on this or that and so you kind of feel pulled in these different directions and so many things are laid out as very black and white and it's only this way or only that when for many issues that's just not the case and so you really have to kind of push back but that's hard on campus when yeah. you know you feel like you could be ostracized or you know demonized for having a certain position so some students may either just go along with the flow some may stay quiet and so for us AJC we've got our leaders for tomorrow program or called lift and that's specifically catered towards high school students we've now are in four cities across the United States piloting this program and what we do is we teach our young students how to not only feel comfortable with their Jewish identity, but also to really educate themselves on these issues so that when they get to college campus, these aren't new things that they've come about, right. but also they know how to have a conversation one-on-one. -on -one. Exactly, because a lot of kids, especially in this area, they're sort of 